interview with Ben, and she said, uh, I've heard you talk about your book three times, but I'm coming back on December 12th. I said, why? <laughs> I wouldn't come and listen to me four times. But I'm, I'm grateful that you, you are here. This book was envisioned as a way to commemorate uh, Missouri's bicentennial. Thus, I realized that before I could undertake a study of my home state and its history, I had to grapple with the meaning of my own past and how it had shaped and informed my present. I soon discovered that something Mark Twain wrote more than a century ago, ago applied directly to me. In one of his uh, lesser known books, a book titled uh, Following the Equator in 1897, Twain wrote this, quote, all that goes to make the me in me began in a Missouri village. I could not agree more with Twain. The first decade and a half of my life and much that came after can be understood only in the context of my growing up in a homogenous community of German-American Catholics. My grandfather is the person on your left, and that's the building I went to school in. It was built in 1892. I didn't go to school that year, but... Uh, <laughs> The building was built originally as a combination school and church. The church was downstairs, or well, the school was downstairs, the church was upstairs. By the time I went to school there, uh, it was uh, solely the community parochial school. Unfortunately, it was torn down in 1963. These German Catholics, most of them subsistence farmers, uh, including my own ancestors, had immigrated to Osage County, Missouri more than a century and a half ago. I grew up with a profoundly deep sense of place, a love of the land with its hills and hollers, its vast hardwood forests, and its clear spring-fed creeks and rivers. Even now, well into my, as Laura pointed out, eighth decade of life in Missouri, one of my favorite places in the world is one that I discovered in my childhood. It is a high bluff above Cedar Creek in Osage County near the place of my birth. From that bluff and beyond the creek at the foot of the bluff and across a fallow field, I can see the ancestral land that provided meaning and sustenance for multiple generations of my family. This place, known locally as Stieferman's Bluff, is where I go for rest and renewal. It reminds me of a message from Bernice Johnson Reagan in a book titled Call to Home. In that book, Reagan says this, quote, if in moving through your life you find yourself lost, Go back to the last place where you knew who you were and what you were doing and start all over again from there. Stieferman's Bluff is that place for me. I grew up in that place. Over time, the place and my experiences there molded me in ways that allowed me to experience, interpret, and shape my very being. This place and its people made me feel like I belonged, like I always had some place to come to, no matter what was going on in the world around me. I needed that sense of security because I also grew up with an equally profound sense of the fragility and impermanence of life and a propensity to fear the loss of people I cared deeply about. That was part of my patrimony, my inheritance. My father lost his mother when he was 18 months old. She died of cancer of the kidney. He never knew his mother, and he suffered a loss throughout his entire life, his too short life. He died in 1979 of the same cancer that claimed his mother. He was only 65 years old, a decade younger than I now am. My mother, uh, was the daughter of a German immigrant, shown here. I'm the kid with the baseball glove over on the far left, your far left. 
Uh, this is only about half of his grandchildren, big families. My mom was, uh, uh, my grandfather came from Germany in 1906. Um, my mother was a middle child of seven. And in 1934, her mother died suddenly. My mother's family was so poor when her mother died that they could not afford the mortician's $65 fee to bury her. Neighbors took up a collection to help with the expenses, but their efforts fell far short of being able to pay the bill. So my mother, who was 12, and her sister, who was 14, took a cross-cut saw. You all know what a cross-cut saw is. It's hard work. They took a cross-cut saw and cut wood for the mortician hauling it to the mortician with the team and wagon, load after load, to pay for their mom's funeral. Anytime I think I've had a bad day, I think of that. And I think, dude, you, you ain't never had a bad day. You will never have a day that bad. Burdened as they were, his, uh, I don't have a, his, a picture of my mom on a hay wagon, the same wagon, same horses, same mom uh, working the farm. Um, Burdened as they were with grief, my mother and her sister were nonetheless forced to deal with a very real adult problem, um, and they had to grow up very quickly. Some years later, my mother married her childhood sweetheart when he was home on leave from the Army Air Corps in 1943. After a weekend honeymoon, my mother's new husband left for the Pacific Theater of War. She never saw him again. He was killed exactly one day short of their one year wedding anniversary. He never met the young daughter who was conceived over that three day honeymoon. 25 years later, that daughter, my sister, then a wife and mother of a five year old, died suddenly of an aggressive brain tumor. Through the years, my family and I sought uh, com comfort and meaning in our Catholic faith. And my childhood was centered around my church. If you've ever seen this church, you wonder how in the hell did they build this out in the middle of nowhere? Uh, it's a magnificent Romanesque structure in a community of 38 people. Uh, if there was a dominant fear, so my life was, was centered around this church and that school you saw and my family. If there was another dominant fear in my life uh, as a child, other than the fear of loss, it was the fear of communism. And some of you my age may remember this. Um, although the Soviet Union had been a critical ally of the United States in the fight against the Axis powers during World War II, Americans' fear of the Soviets' international ambitions took hold even before the war ended. Arguably, that fear was most forcefully articulated by none other than Winston Churchill, the former and future Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. On March 5, 1946, in response to a personal invitation from President Harry Truman, who you can see here to Churchill's right, Churchill delivered a momentous speech at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, just 25 miles or so from here. It was in that speech, formally titled Sinews of Peace, that Churchill warned against the expansionist policies of the Soviet Union, proclaiming that, quote, an iron curtain, end quote, had, quote, descended across the European continent behind which the Soviet sphere was emerging in a diabolical plot aimed at world domination through a totalitarian state. One curious manifestation of Cold War fear in Missouri was an effort to build a hydrogen bomb factory here in Missouri. After the Soviet Union exploded the first atomic bomb on August, its first atomic bomb on August 29th, 1949, the United States and its president our own Harry Truman, uh, became obsessed with the need for the United States to produce 
an even more powerful weapon of war than the one, ones that had been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the hydrogen bomb. Although production of this so-called H-bomb was controversial in many quarters, Missouri Congressman Albert Sidney Johnson Carnahan, father of the late Governor Mel Carnahan, uh, quickly latched on to the idea of building a hydrogen bomb factory in Missouri in his congressional district. Carnahan hoped to see the H-bomb factory built amidst the rugged natural beauty of the Irish wilderness, a 1,258 square mile tract of land spread over Oregon, Shannon, Carter, and Ripley counties. The idea was endorsed by the chairman of the Irish Wilderness Development Association, who urged the Missouri governor to support the plan and to advocate for it in Washington. Advocates argued that the Irish Wilderness met all the requirements for security and seclusion, and residents of the small Oregon County town of Thayer um, asked Carnahan and other congressional leaders to support the plan largely because of the promise to provide good paying jobs in this rather remote part of Missouri. Ultimately, despite Carnahan's appeal and his personal friendship with Truman, an alternative site outside of Missouri, actually in North Carolina, was selected. Although at the time, many residents of the Ozarks were disappointed by the decision and the loss of what they hoped would be plentiful, high-paying jobs, future generations of Missourians, myself included, who loved the pristine beauty of the Irish wilderness uh, may be forever grateful that it, it did not become the location of a hydrogen bomb factory. Personally, fear of the Soviets pervaded my childhood and my adolescence. I had continuing nightmares about an invasion of Frankenstein, Missouri, population 38, by Soviet soldiers. And I was forced to fight them off with my antique Winchester pump 22 rifle. You think I'm making this up, but I had this nightmare for years. One of the most frightening and memorable events of my adolescent life occurred on the night of October 22nd, 1962. It was a Monday evening, and all of my fellow students at St. Thomas Aquinas Preparatory Seminary in Hannibal uh, and I were in our mandatory evening study hall. A television was brought into the room so that we could all watch uh, President John F. Kennedy deliver his Cuban Missile Crisis speech. Y'all remember that? Now, six decades later, I still remember the absolute terror I felt in hearing the President of the United States deliver an ultimatum to the USSR President Nikita Khrushchev, or Premier Nikita Khrushchev, and the Soviet Union. I and most of the others in the room felt certain that nuclear war and annihilation were imminent. Some of my classmates were crying. Others asked permission to use a phone so they could call their parents to tell them goodbye. This was real. Of course, a nuclear war in which all of us died never came to be. But our fear of communism did not subside. That, of course, is what got us into the quagmire known as the Vietnam War. Among the more than 1,400 Missouri soldiers who went to Vietnam and never came back was my high school classmate and dear friend Paul Hasenbeck of Freeburg, Missouri, who has been missing in action since April 21st, 1967, more than 56 years ago. My effort to understand the historic forces that shaped me and my life led me to explore in this book some of what I have come to regard as enduring themes of Missouri history, persistent trends and problems that each generation of Missourians has struggled to address. One of the most common themes of our history, in my opinion, is that of suspicion and hostility toward our federal government. 
In 2016, when Josh Hawley was running as a candidate for the office of Missouri Attorney General, he told a Columbia, Missouri newspaper reporter, quote, the Missouri Attorney General's office should become a platform for challenging federal rules and regulation. That should be the focus of the Attorney General of Missouri. Upon being elected to that office, of course, Attorney General Hawley proceeded to do just that, as did his successor, Eric Schmidt, and Schmidt's successor, our current Attorney General, uh, Andrew Bailey. My point is, fighting the federal government is a long-standing Missouri tradition, perfectly illustrated in 2021 when the Missouri General Assembly passed the Second Amendment Preservation Act, SAPA, aimed at nullifying a number of federal gun laws in the state of Missouri. The fact is, we Missourians have been fighting the federal government throughout our existence, certainly throughout statehood and even before. The question of whether Missouri would be admitted to the Union as a slave or free state placed Missourians at odds with the government they were trying to join. Most Missourians wanted Missouri to be a slave state. And virtually all Missourians, even those who were opposed to slavery, thought it was none of the federal government's damn business whether Missouri was slave or free. So when a movement emerged in the Congress to exclude slaves and slavery in Missouri, Missourians reacted with outraged disbelief. Thomas Hart Benton, whose uh, statue you can see, uh, having been moved here from uh, the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. this year, it's in our gallery. Thomas Hart Benton, the St. Louis newspaper publisher and future U.S. Senator, uh, became one of the fiercest opponents of the federal government's effort to restrict slavery in Missouri, arguing that Missourians needed, quote, to make a fair and regular stand against the encroachment of Congress upon the sovereignty of the states, end quote. Stephen Rector, the surveyor general for Illinois and Missouri and Arkansas, introduced a militant tone into the discussion when he delivered this toast at a Howard County gathering in the summer of 1819. Quote, may the Missourians defend their rights, if necessary, even at the expense of blood, against the unprecedented restriction which was attempted on them by the Congress of the United States, end quote. Just think for a moment of the irony of that statement. We Missourians were threatening to secede from and go to war with the country we're trying to join. This inclination of hostility toward and resistance to actions and policies of the federal government, as I said, may be one of the most common and persistent impulses that flows through our 200 years of statehood. There are countless examples of this, evident in every period of our history including the so-called Honey War during the 1830s and 1840s, when we objected to the borderline between Missouri and Iowa that the federal government tried to impose on us. Residents in the western part of our state hardly need reminding of the devastating consequences of a clash with the federal government. General Thomas Ewing's infamous Order No. 11 can still rile residents of the burnt district more than 150 years after the incident occurred. More recently, we went, witnessed what uh, Governor Warren Hearns called the creative localism of his administration during the 1960s when he tried to keep urban renewal and the war on poverty out of Missouri because he didn't want to take any federal funds for fear that would lead to the federal government telling Missourians what they could and could not do. In 1968, when civil unrest occurred in Kansas City in the wake of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Hearns did everything he could to try to make certain that federal troops were not called in to help suppress the riot. One of the most egregious examples of this mindset occurred in 1918 when Congress passed the Migratory Bird Act 
designed to comply with the provisions of an international treaty with Canada. The treaty aimed to protect a number of migratory birds, including the wood duck, a favorite target of Missouri waterfowl hunters. Notwithstanding the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution, which establishes that the Constitution, federal laws made pursuant to it, and treaties made under its authority are the supreme law of the land, Missouri's Attorney General, a Democrat from Monroe County named Frank Winton McAllister, maintained that the federal law was unconstitutional and that Missourians, he included, were not bound by it. McAllister, you see, was a duck hunter. And so armed with his shotgun and a huge amount of self-righteous indignation, in March of 1919, he led a party of duck hunters into a marsh near Nevada, Missouri. Uninhibited in his defiance of federal law, he apparently tipped off a federal game warden in advance of the hunt, telling him of his intent to violate the federal law that he thought was illegal. The game warden took the bait, showed up, arrested the McAllister party, and seized 76 ducks and a goose that the party had killed. Whereupon, the federal game warden was arrested by the local sheriff because the federal agent did not have a state hunting license and was deemed to be in, illegally in possession of Missouri game. See, how can you not love Missouri? <laughs> Subsequently arraigned by a judge in Clinton County, Attorney General McAllister challenged the legitimacy of the federal law and sought an injunction to restrain federal game wardens from enforcing it. A federal judge voted or ruled against him. The Attorney General of, the United, of Missouri appealed to the United States Supreme Court. This case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And on April 19, 1920, the US Supreme Court ruled that the Migratory Bird Act of 1918 was, in fact, constitutional. There are many, many, many other examples of this penchant for fighting the federal government uh, in our history, but I suspect you get the point. Another persistent issue that has plagued we Missourians throughout our history is the issue of race. It's a picture of uh, Sue's Younger from our collection, one of the Younger family, outlaw families, slaves, and slave persons. The Missouri Compromise, which enabled us to become a state in 1821, uh, of course, had slavery at its very heart. Slavery was at the heart of the discussion about the circumstances and the condition under which Missouri would become a state. Would we be slave, a slave state, or would we be a free state? We have been struggling with the issue of race ever since. Indeed, the centrality of race to Missouri history is one of the most constant features of our past, our present, and I believe our future. In 2015, in the midst of the controversy surrounding the killing of Michael Brown and Ferguson and the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, a national news organization referred to Missouri as, quote, the heart of racial tension in America, end quote. During the antebellum period, we passed a number of laws aimed at controlling the black population by restricting their, their access to education, their mobility, their right to control their own labor, and their interpersonal relations. When enslaved people were finally freed in Missouri on January 11th, 1865, several months before the war ended, we tried to restrict where, uh, who they could marry, where they could go to school, where they could live, where they could worship, where they could seek lodging and entertainment, even where they could be buried. Black cemeteries segregated separate cemeteries for African Americans, such as this one, uh, the Antioch Cemetery in Clinton, Missouri, are ubiquitous in our state. It is no accident 
that some of the most important legal cases regarding race to come before the United States Supreme Court over the past 200 years came out of Missouri. The famous Dred Scott case in 1857, which originated out of St. Louis. In that case, the US Supreme Court uh, ruled against Scott's effort to obtain his freedom and ordered the Missouri Compromise null and void, or declared it null and void, with Chief Justice Roger B. Taney proclaiming that no black person had any rights that a white person was obligated to recognize. The Lloyd Gaines case, which aimed to end the University of Missouri's effort to prevent blacks from attending the University of Missouri, began in Columbia, Missouri in 1936 when a black graduate of Lincoln University tried to enroll in the University of Missouri School of Law. At that time, by the way, and it, this still amazes me, at that time, if a black student sought a course of instruction that was not available at Lincoln University, the all-black school in Jefferson City, the process would be for them to apply to the University of Missouri, be rejected, and then take their letter of rejection to the, the Capitol and request that the legislature appropriate money to send them out of the state. So in the 40s and 50s and 60s, you saw a lot of black professionals whose terminal degrees were from University of Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, and so forth. Uh, Lloyd Gaines challenged that system by attempting to go to the University of Missouri School of Law. He lost his case right down the street in Boone County Circuit Court. He lost his case in the Missouri Supreme Court. And in 1938, the US Supreme Court ruled that Missouri had either to admit Gaines to the University of Missouri, or it had to create a, quote, separate but equal, end quote, institution, a law school for him. What did Missouri do? It chose the latter course of action and established the Lincoln University School of Law, which by its very nature had nowhere near the resources that the University of Missouri School of Law had. And then there was the Shelley versus Kramer case, no relation, <laughs> heard in 1948, which originated in St. Louis out of an effort by a black couple from Starkville, Mississippi, J.D. and Ethel Shelley, who purchased a house, house is still standing at 4600 Labadee Street in St. Louis. Two days after the family moved into the house in October of 1945, two white neighbors sued to evict them, citing a, quote, restrictive covenant, end quote, attached to the house's deed. The restriction dating to 1911 barred any owners of the property from transferring property ownership to, quote, persons of the Negro or Mongolian race, end quote. The Missouri Supreme Court came down on the side of the white neighbors and against the Shelleys, who commented that, quote, all we wanted was a decent place to raise our children, end quote. Ultimately, the United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Shelleys and voided the use of restrictive covenants that prohibited the sale of real estate to African Americans. Another topic I sought to explore in this book is our state's relative standing in relationships to other states in the Union over the course of the past uh, century and more. Missouri grew tre tremendously during the 19th century, largely because of the availability of good farmland at a time when uh, virtually uh, all, or certainly most, Americans made their living farming, uh, certainly Missourians. Uh, it was not until the decade of the 1920s that Missouri became a more urban than rural state. Many migrants to Missouri were people such as Henry Vest Bingham, father of the future famed artist George Caleb Bingham, who had suffered a devastating financial setback in his birth county of Augusta in Virginia. In the fall of 1818, the elder Bingham set out from Virginia as the editor of his 1818 diary noted later, quote, to take the road west to begin in search preferably of land 
that would raise the crops that were familiar to him, tobacco, corn, and hay. He was searching, I would argue, less for a new way of life than he was for a place where he could re-engage in the life he already knew, a place of promise. He found it in Missouri. On June 17, 1818, Bingham wrote this in his diary, quote, the lands I have seen in this territory being with other advantages sufficient to cause me to move here in preference to any other country I have yet seen, end quote. Bingham was not alone. This, of course, is the famous painting of um, Daniel Boone descending through the Cumberland Gap. Thousands upon thousands. I realize this is earlier than, uh, than I'm talking about, but it's a great image. Uh, thousands upon thousands, like Bingham, pulled up roots from their homes east of the Mississippi River and headed west. To John Mason Peck, an itinerant missionary to frontier Missouri, quote, it seemed as though Kentucky and Tennessee were breaking up and moving to the far west, end quote. An article in the November 10th, 1819 issue of the St. Louis newspaper noted that a St. Charles resident reported that an average of, quote, 120 wagons, carriages, and carts passed through St. Charles each week for months. Indeed, Howard County, Missouri, county seat uh, Fayette, who, some of whose illustrious citizens are here today, uh, became the fastest growing county in the entire country in the years surrounding Missouri becoming a state. And large numbers of people continued to come to Missouri throughout the 19th century. This growth in population was aided by state government action, such as that taken by the Missouri General Assembly in February 1865, when it created, when the General Assembly created a state board of immigration and authorized the expenditure of funds to send agents to the eastern states and to Europe to recruit new Missouri citizens in the state. Let that sink in for a minute. By 1900, Missouri's population reached 3,108,000 people, making it the fifth largest state in the union, the fifth largest state in the entire country. St. Louis was the fourth largest city in the United States. Optimism abounded in turn-of-the-century Missouri, with the nation's attention drawn to the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, here's the famous Pike, the St. Louis World's Fair, that opened in 1904, and the emergence of new technological advances, including the birth of the automobile, seeming to serve as harbingers of a century of progress. But Missouri has been in relative decline ever since. By 1910, we dropped to the seventh most populous state. By 1940, we were 10th. In 1970, we dropped to 13th. During the 1980s, Kansas City actually supplanted St. Louis as our state's most populous city, with, I think, the 1985 I-70 World Series serving as a metaphor for St. Louis's relative decline. Here you see Missouri's two senators, Tom Eagleton and John Danforth, having to eat crow in Kansas City, celebrating the victory of the Kansas City Royals. By 2020, Missouri, which had been fifth in population in 1900, was 18, the 18th most populous state in the Union. 62 of Missouri's 115 counties, including the St. Louis, St. Louis City, lost population. 62 of Missouri's counties lost population between 2019 and, pardon me, 2020. Put simply, over the course of the past century, immigrants and migrants from other countries and other states increasingly have found Missouri a less desirable place to live than many other parts of the country. Why? I don't know. That's maybe the next book. But <laughs> one possible answer is that we have been following the same advice about what will bring people to our state for more than two 
centuries, namely that low taxes would and will result in more and more people wanting to come to live here. This started with our very first governor, Alexander McNair, who laid out a vision for Missouri in his 1821 inaugural address. I'm quoting from that address. As we expect to increase in wealth and number by the accession of citizens from other state, states, it is our policy to remove every obstacle and hold out every inducement to immigration, end quote. A key element of this effort would require, quote, the establishment of a rigid economy in every department of the state and the retrenchment of every unnecessary expense, end quote. In short, if state government would hold expenses down and keep taxes low, more people would immigrate to Missouri and those immigrants would, quote, divide and diminish the burden of taxation, end quote. Our state history is replete with people and policies aimed at reducing or limiting taxes in the hope that that action will attract more people to our state. No one expressed a sentiment better than a Democratic governor, John Phelps, a Springfield lawyer. Elected in 1876, Phelps said this in his inaugural address, quote, we must economize, we must reduce the expenditures of government it may be difficult to do so, but it must be done. He elaborated, quote, we should endeavor to place taxation at its lowest limit. We invite population, and if to all our sources of wealth and prosperity, we can with truth say the taxes of the municipal and state government are low, we offer strong inducements for the enterprising, industrious, and intelligent people to make their abode with us, end quote. In short, the contention was and is that low taxes would and will uh, bring increased population, which in turn would and will result in prosperity and improved well-being for all of us. A century or so later, we enshrined this low tax philosophy in our state constitution through passage of the Hancock Amendment in 1980 and Hancock II in 1994. Arguably, this emphasis on governmental frugality has handicapped our ability to build the state's infrastructure and provide services that residents and would-be residents expect. Just recently, the Missouri Department of Economic Development made clear that, quote, Missouri's growth in GDP and productivity has been below the nation and Missouri's Midwestern peers since 2010, end quote. Sadly, we find our state ranking poorly among our sister states in terms of services provided to our citizens. The 2021-2022 National Education Association Rankings and Estimates Report places Missouri teachers at 47th for average teacher pay in the nation. Missouri's starting pay for teachers is 50th among the 50 states. Missouri ranks 43rd among the states in terms of public safety. In 2020, Missouri ranked 40th in terms of life expectancy, with Missourians expected to live 1.9 fewer years than the national average. We are the eighth worst in the nation in terms of road conditions. We rank 42nd in the country uh, in average health care. We have 14% uninsured rate in the state, which ranks us 38th among the states. We rank 16th highest in suicide rates. One of the few areas in which we rank number one in the country, at least in 2019, was in meth manufacturing. <laughs> Not all is dismal and dire in Missouri. Uh, you're thinking, this is the most depressing damn thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but we do have the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> and we have the Kansas City Royals and the St. Louis Cardinals, even if both of those teams had less than stellar seasons. We have the ninth-ranked college football team in the nation. We have professional soccer and hockey. We have world-class museums and art galleries, such as the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City, the St. Louis Art Museum, the Spiva Art Center in Joplin, 
and the Dahm Museum of Contemporary Art in Sedalia. We have the St. Louis and Kansas City zoos, the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis, and Powell Gardens in the Kansas City area. We have Silver Dollar City in the world headquarters of Bass Pro, described recently by a writer for The Atlantic magazine as one of the best run retail establishments in the entire country. We have Washington University, which consistently ranks among the top 20 universities in the state, or in the country, rather. And we have the University of Missouri, the Roy Blunt Next Gen Precision Health Center, the University of Missouri School of Journalism, the oldest school of journalism in the country. Our state parks and State Department of Conservation provide a great variety of venues through which we can enjoy the beauties and the wonders of the natural world. And our lakes, rivers, and streams are among the most beautiful and inviting in the country. As we enter our third century of statehood, perhaps it is appropriate to ponder how we might rekindle the notion of our state as a place of promise, where citizens and governmental officials work together to find the right balance between public support and private initiatives so that public services that citizens expect uh, can be provided without stifling the creative energy that has always been a part of the Missouri experience. Perhaps, in short, there are reasons far beyond the reason of low taxes to live in Missouri. I have hope for my native state and its people. The famous Missouri artist, Thomas Hart Benton, once remarked, quote, I like the men and women who make the real Missouri. I get along with them. I feel the same way. The state and its people sometimes confuse and confound me, even annoy and aggravate me, but I've never not loved it and them. My own life has become so intertwined with the history of this state that it is sometimes hard for me to separate my own past from that of this state. It and I are one, though we are sometimes at war and on the verge of disowning each other. Missouri is my home, always has been always will be. Seven generations of my family have lived here. Most of us have died or will die here. Missouri and its people belong to me and I to them. So today I say with hope, tempered by an understanding of our complex past, may Missouri always be a place of promise and may our third century of statehood be the time in which that promise is fulfilled. Thank you very much. How did Claiborne Jackson fail so badly in getting the state legislature to agree to um, put Missouri in the Confederacy? Well, he didn't fail that badly with the legislature. It was with the people of Missouri. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think even many Missouri slave owners were unionists. Uh, many Missouri slave owners, slave owners, especially in the uh, Boonslick area, were actually economically dependent upon the South. For example, the hemp industry was totally dependent on the cotton industry because mid-Missouri provided the hemp that made the rope that bound the cotton bales. But it is, it's one of those great mysteries. That is one of those moments in our history uh, where it could have gone either way. But again, I'm, I'm convinced that more Missourians by far opposed uh, secession. You know, I don't think they were ready for secession, uh, but they also did, many did not want to lose uh, slavery. In your view, what does it take to be a Missourian? Are there people who are more Missourian than other people, um, <laughs> as far as people who live in the state? How in the world am I supposed to answer that? Um, um, first of all, I think one of the realities of, I, I think it's impossible to answer that question. That said, I'll try to answer it. Um, there are many Missourians. Missouri's. 
You know, wh that's one of the things I find endlessly intriguing about Missouri is that you can drive from Kennett or Malden in southeast Missouri up to uh, Rockford in northwest Missouri and feel like you have crossed multiple country national lines. Uh, you know, we even pronounce the name of the state differently depending on our, I think, our ancestral roots. Uh, but I, I do think that, you know, I think that this hostility to government is one of our characteristics. I think most Missourians share that. We're not only hostile toward the federal government, we're hostile toward our state government, and our governments are hostile toward each other. I mean, some of the big fights that have occurred in the last couple of years have been between uh, local governments that tried to pass laws that the legislature didn't like, and so they tried, even though they were the people who supported local rule, they passed laws prohibiting those local rules from going into effect. Um, I, I really can't answer your question, Rachel. They, they were absolutely influential, and in fact, some have argued that if the convention had been held in central Missouri instead of St. Louis, where there's so many Germans, that the state might have gone with the Confederacy. Uh, the Germans, I, I feel like I can say this because I'm all ancestrally German, so I'm not attacking my own ethnic group, but th the Germans were fiercely opposed to slavery, but they were also very racist. Uh, they had imbibed most of the world's view of African Americans. And so it was a, it was a complex kind of inheritance that they had, but the Germans had a tremendous role in making sure that Missouri remained in the Union. Would you say, or to what extent would you say that Missouri's history of racism coming out of, though, and into and out of the Civil War, that its politics was shaped by Dixiecrats? You mean the the National Dixiecrat Party, or, well, uh, or or just people who... Yeah, yes, they didn't... My experience would tell me that many Democrats from the earlier decades of this century, they were Democrats. They called themselves Democrats, but they had lots of racist ideas. I mean, but the entire Democratic Party in the South was racist. Yes. And Missouri Democrats were very conservative Democrats. You, you'd be hard pressed to name a dozen historically liberal Democrats in Missouri. Uh, you know, I mentioned Warren Hearns, who was from Charleston, Missouri, and a graduate of the University of Missouri School of Law. He didn't want any uh, federal interference, and, and a lot of this had to do with race. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's part of our heritage. I think you've explained it, but you know, outsiders view us as the show me state, and I think you've basically explained where we got that slogan. But could you add to that the historical genesis of that slogan? There's a, there's actually a lot of debate about the genesis of that slogan. Some argue that it dates to the days of the California Gold Rush when Missourians who were farmers came to California and didn't know a damn thing about uh, mining, uh, it became common to say, well, he's from Missouri, you gotta show him. Um, the, the widely, the, the most common uh, kind of expression of the origins of that term come from the 1890s when a congressman from uh, southeast Missouri, for whom a street is named here, Willem Vandiver. Uh, how do, do you pronounce it Vandiver or Vandiver? Yeah, okay, you pronounce it right then. Um, <laughs> um, Willard Vandiver had been a college president at, at CIMO. Uh, he, he was a congressman, he was a Democrat, a very conservative Democrat. And supposedly there was a gathering in the 1890s uh, uh, with many people who were trying to persuade Congress to pass higher taxes to build up the Navy. And Vandiver was skeptical of this. And this parade of people 
came to the podium to talk about the weapons they could build and the ships they could build and so forth. And finally, it came time for Vandiver to speak. And he, he lumbered to the podium and kind of scowled over the audience and said, supposedly, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton and cobblers and Democrats. I am from Missouri. You've got to show me. I think that, uh, you know, that may have happened, but it, it probably, even if the show me moniker had been used before, that's the incident that popularized it and made it uh, endemic to use all over the country. Okay, one more. One more? We got yep, time? One more. That was almost a good one to end on, Gary. <laughs> Culturally, I look at your era. I think a baby boomer, your age, you're a Missourian. We were a, we were a rural state. We get that in our blood from our soil. What are we doing for our children who are living on the concrete pavements now in Missouri? Are we still handing down Missouri? Are your grandkids Missouri? Do they go back to the bluff? They do. Because I make them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, well, first of all, though, we're not a rural state anymore, and we haven't been since the 1920s. Um, far more people live along the borders of our state than in the interior of the state. Uh, you know, I, I, this could go on forever, but I, I, I worry about education, uh, particularly history. I don't think history is taught all that much in uh, elementary and high schools, and even even in college. Uh, you know, I, I think that's probably, like I said, another book. But it, but it, is, it is of concern to me that uh, people know so little about the state's past, people who live here. Um, I, 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 should, uh, uh, I should tell you that I grew up hating history. History had been taught to me as names and dates and places you had to memorize. I wasn't very good at it. I didn't know why, why people should know what dead people did. Uh, I was going to be a sociologist and save the world. Nobody in my family had ever gone to college. My parents didn't go to high school because there was no high school to go to. Uh, but, and I went to Lincoln University in Jefferson City initially because it was 30 miles from my home and it was affordable. And suddenly, this kid from Osage County, who grew up in a county with one black person, was confronted with the reality of a highly integrated institution that was about 50-50 black and white, but also had a large African and Middle Eastern population. And it was a revolutionary experience for me. And ultimately, I was troubled by Vietnam and by the Civil Rights Movement. And so I started to read history to understand those things. So now I've come full circle because history, instead of trying to work among marginalized people as a social worker, I decided I wanted to understand the history or the histories of marginalized people. And that's uh, pretty much the story of my life. Thanks so much. Thank you.